When people talk about their favorite fantasy series of all time, they say a lot of the same things. They'll say Game of Thrones, or Lord of the Rings, or Wheel of Time, or Thomas Covenant, Dragon Riders of Pern, The Dark Tower, Chronicles of Pridian. Well, not today. Today I'm going to talk about four of the most underrated fantasy series of all time. They are beautiful and epic and heartbreaking and dangerous and challenging and heartwarming and fun. I really, really hope that today I'm going to talk about something that you are going to love. So I'm really excited. Let's get to it. The first series that I'm going to talk about is The Monarchies of God by Paul Carney. This series is set in a kind of parallel Europe, roughly in the late 1400s. There's gunpowder and cannons and clashes all over the place. There's church versus state. There is east versus west. There is church versus magic. Carney's world is torn apart by religious war and chaos, and that's why expert mariner Richard Hawkwood is tasked with taking a ship across the sea to find a land where apparently safe haven has already been found. Or has it? In this series, Carney uses the Western Schism of the 1300s. That's when uh, the Catholic Church broke up into multiple factions and each had their own pope as kind of a thematic backdrop for this series. This is a series for fantasy fans who are really interested in religions and different cultures and seafaring and even military might. Seriously, Carney's battles in the Monarchies of God are some of the best, maybe the best I've ever read in my whole life. Especially the naval stuff, they're clear and descriptive and exciting but also properly horrifying. Carney is not at all a glorifier of violence and it's very clear from this series that he sees war in all its forms as just a really poor way of resolving any kind of dispute. It's a major theme throughout the series. Which is really interesting because war and fighting and battles are such a huge part of fantasy literature and the Monarchies of God just kind of stands to the side a little bit and tries to examine that culture and even our approach to that culture in literature. This is just a tightly plotted, character-driven story that mirrors our own world in a lot of ways but also feels just really exciting and really new. Fans of Martin might really like this one because Carney is kind of known for his pessimism with his characters. I don't know if he's as ruthless as Martin is with his characters but he's pretty close but if you stick with the series, I think you'll be really glad that you did. It's not all doom and gloom at all. It just, it just starts that way. <laughs> the series was originally published in five volumes back in the 90s, but it's since been re-released in two omnibus editions. There's um, Hawkwood and the Kings and uh, Century of the Soldier. All told, the series is about 1,500 pages, which is not small by any stretch of the imagination, but when you compare it with... Jordan and Martin and Terry Goodkind and these kinds of guys. Carney really shows that you don't need epic size to tell an epic story. Next we have a big series by author Janie Wirtz, The Wars of Light and Shadow, which might be the most underrated fantasy series I've ever come across in my life. Both because of its scope in that Wirtz just published the penultimate 10th volume in the series in 2017, but also because of its quality. Janie Wirtz is just incredibly, undeniably talented. The writing in this series is some of the most lush and beautiful I've ever come across in any genre. But it's dense. Like, this is not YA level reading at all. Everything you get from The Wars of Light and Shadow, you earn. Like, there will be times when you will reread a paragraph two times, three times, just to extract everything out of it because there's so much there, which sounds, I think, really annoying, but it won't be at all. You will want to do it. You will love doing it because it's just, there's just so much in there. The books start pretty typically. The Royal Navy is fighting a fleet of pirates and even though they've won um, this battle, the majority of their fleet is kind of decimated and um, the recovery is pretty rough. A very important prisoner though is taken alive and that's Arathon, who's known as the Master of Shadow, the bastard son of the Queen, who ran away from the King years ago to be with the Pirate King, but she has since died. Ever since, the Royal King and his heir, Lysir, 
who's known as the Lord of Light, have been obsessed with finding this bastard son, Arathon, taking him back to the capital and humiliating, torturing, and killing him for his betrayal. But once they have him, it becomes very clear very quickly through some things I can't really talk about because of spoilers, that Lysir and Arathon are not just at the center of some kind of familial conflict. They are important to the world and this massive story that not only covers generations, but even like ages of the world. Ultimately, the balance of the world is in their hands, classic fantasy trope. And that's as much as I can really tell you without giving away massive spoilers, which sucks because uh, this story does not go where you think it's going to go. My favorite description I think I've ever read of The Wars of Light and Shadow is that the series doesn't um, sprawl as it gets larger, it deepens. There are 10 books in this series now. It will finish with the next book, which will be the 11th book. This isn't Janie where it's just adding threads and adding characters to draw it out. She's adding layers over time. She's adding complexity. She's adding history. The hallmark of this series and the thing that I love the most is that where it's just constantly asks you to reevaluate everything you know, everything you've read. Characters that you hated initially become some of your favorites. The line between good and bad is often very confusing, but very interesting. Like your assumptions are constantly challenged with, with major characters, with minor characters, with major plot points, with minor plot points. It's just so intricately plotted. It's just brilliant. If you're a big fan of magic, the books have more than one like fully fleshed out magic system going. Um, and it's described, which I love, this is the part that I love, it's described both very lyrically and very precise at the same time. This series has probably the craziest, biggest, most impressive siege I've ever heard of in a book. Um, it also might have the most um, frightening use of dark magic I've ever seen. Ah, it's just, it's so good just talking about this makes me want to go and read it and start it all over again. I just, I love this series so much and I don't know anybody who's read it. It's just, it's so fantastic. If you're a lover of language, please try and read The Wars of Light and Shadow. It's just brilliant. Janie Wirtz should be gigantic. I know why she's not, because the language she uses can be difficult for some people. It's not just easy light reading. Um, it's not like complicated or difficult words. It's just, it's just dense the way she writes. Um, so it's gonna, it's gonna turn some people off. People, some people might not have the patience for it, but it's, I think it's brilliant. The story's fantastic. It's tons of fun at the same time. I think you'll love it. Series number three, I hope will not turn you off by this disgusting cover that it has. Um, that's the Crown of Stars series by Kate Elliott. In it, King Wendar holds the crown, but his kingdom is in turmoil because his sister, Sabella, has long had um, plans for the throne and she's trying to wrest it from him. And there are basically armies flocking on either side. This internal conflict has weakened Wendar's defenses and now there are raiders, both human and non-human, kind of flocking across the borders to try and seize some of this power. And at the same time, there are kind of dark spirits that have started to kind of roam the land in broad daylight. And this is when, surprise, surprise, two innocents get thrown into the chaos. I bet they won't have anything to do with it, right? One is a young stable boy named Elaine, who kind of receives like a prophetic vision, and the other is a young girl named Leath, who kind of unknowingly has the power to end this war single-handedly. But before they can kind of discover and accept their destinies, they first have to kind of go backward and understand some things about their origins, because um, where they came from plays as an important role in this story as where they're going. At first, Elaine feels a bit like an archetypal character. He's an orphaned boy who was promised to the church, much to his chagrin, but um, he's actually just wonderfully different because he doesn't find um, like martial prowess or special abilities at any point during the story. He's kind of a wannabe warrior that's not good at it at all. And the thing that he really brings to this tale is compassion. He's the hero of an epic fantasy story and all he brings to the table are essentially um, wits and sensitivity. Think of a, like a Franciscan friar like William of Ockham or Francis of Assisi, just
just with magic flying all around him. And if that sounds a bit boring or weird to you, it's not. Um, believe me when I tell you that Elaine is just full of surprises. He's fantastic. On the other hand, there's Liath, who is the daughter of two um, sorcerers, but she is deaf to magic herself. Or is she? Ultimately, it's another man's desire to possess what's hidden inside of her that kind of kicks off her part of the story. And on top of that, we have kings and queens and nobles and freeholders and warriors and clergymen and half-elven princes and star-crossed romances. It has a bit of everything. This, this series is like seven, I think seven books long. It's got everything you want in, a, in an epic fantasy series. And probably best of all, this is not like a male-dominated series at all. There's probably at least 50-50 male to female characters. Like this is not your traditional male-dominated epic. This is different. Again, when you take one look at these awful covers, probably what you're gonna think of is just like knights and dragons and chivalry and just old school 80s fantasy from the look of it. But what you get is just so much more. There's betrayal and there's heroism and there's romance and science and religion and visions of the future with like dreams of old empires. There's theological disputes, there's magic, there's realism, there's martyrs and magical creatures and everything else that you really want in a big, bold, brash, fantasy series. It's all here. It's all great. Just read it. It's so good. And finally, no one will mistake this next series for a Pulitzer Prize winner, but Star Wars didn't win Best Picture either, so take it with a grain of salt. The Tales of the Ketty J series is just a tribute to old-fashioned fun, and just it's elevated to another level by a storyteller who I think has raised the bar for an entire genre. Steampunk. Here's the skinny. Darian Frey is the captain of a ship called the Ketty J, and he's the leader of a small and like really highly dysfunctional band of like layabouts. He's your classic dashing rogue, and him and his gang um, kind of make their living on the wrong side of the law, avoiding the uh, pursuit of the Coalition Navy. With their trio of flying ships, they run contraband and they rob airships and um, generally make like a nuisance of themselves. The story begins when Frey gets a hot tip that a freighter carrying a ton of valuables and not a lot of security is just ripe for the picking. And they go to steal all of this and all of a sudden the freighter explodes. Suddenly Frey isn't just considered a nuisance anymore, he is now public enemy number one because people think him and his band have blown up this massive freighter full of all this cash. So the Navy gets on his tail to try and take him down. But Frey knows something that they don't. He knows that the freighter was rigged to blow up. So he was framed for this murder, essentially. And if he wants to prove it, he's gonna have to catch the real culprit. So he has to face down both liars and past lovers in dogfights and gunfights with dukes and with demons, and it will take all of his criminal talents to prove that he's not the criminal that they think he is, if that makes sense. I've always described the Tales of the Ketty J series as kind of equal parts Firefly and Pirates of the Caribbean, if not like in content, at least in style and feel. It starts with a book called Retribution Falls, and it's, it's just, I remember when I first found it because it was a, the type of book that I've always been looking for, just something like whip smart and also like incredibly fun at the same time. A lot of books are described that way, but I think very few actually are. And this absolutely is. Chris Wooding, who authored this series, really loves like moral ambiguities. He loves kind of flawed heroes, um, traitors and love affairs and just dreams that go to shit. The crew of the Ketty J are just like on their own, they are just abject failures. Some of them are just really hard to root for sometimes. Um, but in their faults lies Retribution, which is why the first the first novel is called Retribution Falls. The crew consists of, let me see if I can name them off for you, um, a demonologist, a drunk doctor, a seemingly undead enigma. I can't really say more than that. It's a really strange character, but kind of cool. Uh, a freed slave, a coward, a delusional 
hot shot pilot, which you, you, you always love to have, um, a golem, and a man who just can't commit to any relationship whatsoever, professional, personal, intimate, and that person's their captain, who they all have to listen to. But Wooding just infuses this entire cast of characters with so much charm and heart. It's just, it's so much fun. I just love this. I keep using the word fun, but it's its one of the most fun series I've ever read in my whole life. I don't think I've, any, I've ever touched anything like this, other than in movies. It just has that, like, vim and vigor that you see in really great fun, funny blockbuster movies, but but in a book. It's so rare to find. It's so rare to find that. And Wooding just nails it. Basically, if you like fun adventure stories that are really smart, read this series. So there you go. Those are four of my most underrated fantasy series of all time. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing some. So if you have a series that you think not enough people um, have read and more people need to read, please leave a comment below. I'd love to know. I love reading kind of underrated lists or stuff that's just been kind of like simmering in the background of our kind of collective conscious for years or even decades and somehow we don't even know about it or haven't been paying enough attention to it because some of these big blockbuster series just get all the attention. So whenever you can find kind of a needle in the haystack, I just love that. So if you know of any that have kind of flown under the radar the last couple years, please comment below. Let me know. I would love it. And with that, I will say goodbye. My name is Rick. Thank you so much for sticking around. I know this was another long one, I'm sure. Uh, after I edit this thing, it's going to be uh, sizable. So uh, if you got this far, I very much appreciate it. Um, always love talking to fantasy fans. So talk to me down below, uh, and we'll keep the conversation going. I will talk to you guys in a few days. Bye.